Welcome to Lincoln Log, where we speak with leading historians and other officials about their stories, research, and wisdom. Expand your knowledge and indulge your curiosity here on Lincoln Log. This podcast is produced by the Abraham Lincoln Association, aiding and promoting Abraham Lincoln's life and legacy. Founded in 1908, the ALA remains the nation's oldest and largest Lincoln organization. Learn more at abrahamlincolnassociation.org. Greetings. I am your host, Joshua Claiborne, and I am pleased to welcome Elizabeth Mitchell to our Lincoln Log podcast. Elizabeth's newest book, Lincoln's Lie, A True Civil War Caper Through Fake News, Wall Street, and the White House, is officially released on October 6th this year, 2020. Her other books include Liberty's Torch, The Great Adventure to Build the Statue of Liberty, Three Strides Before the Wire, The Dark and Beautiful World of Horse Racing, and W, Revenge of the Bush Dynasty. Her best-selling e-single, The Fearless Mrs. Goodwin, tells the tale of the first female detective in U.S. history. Previously, Mitchell served as executive director of George Magazine. She joins us from her home in Brooklyn, New York. Elizabeth, thank you for joining the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Now, your new book, Lincoln's Lie, really focuses on and uses a mysterious 1864 newspaper article to reveal how Lincoln manipulated the media during the Civil War. And specifically, two newspapers published a call allegedly authored by President Lincoln, according to some, for the uh, immediate conscription of 400,000 more Union soldiers. When Lincoln sent troops to seize the newspaper presses and arrest the editors, it became clear that the proclamation was a lie. What drew you to to this incident enough to write a new book about it? Well, um, like many of the stories that I've pursued, you know, both book form and then also uh, for articles, they often come out of other research. And so in this case, uh, I had been working on my Liberty's Torch uh, book. And in that research, uh, I found that the main fundraising for the uh, pedestal of the statue in the United States came from Joseph Pulitzer using his newspaper, The World, to uh, to bring it to life. And, and basically he had bought the newspaper at a cut rate uh, you know, price. And then he was both trying to sort of brand it as the newspaper of the little man against the tycoons. And he was also trying to build subscriptions and uh, readership. And so mm. it said that he bought that paper at such a, a low price because of the fact that it had been so um, shamed by having run this false proclamation. And then, you know, I looked more into that and found that this was this moment where Abraham Lincoln uh, had ordered the newspapers to be shut down uh, by military force. He had arrested the newspaper editors. And, you know, I, I was looking at this well before we got into this kind of uh, crisis of the presidency and the press um, and was fascinated by the story and decided that I would pursue it more. Uh, and it could, you know, definitely there was enough there to be a book. And then it just kept getting more intriguing the further I went. So basically, I mean, it's possible that um, according to some and maybe and that, that Lincoln was okay with and actually did leak this to the, to, to the newspaper. And that's sort of the interesting twist, I guess, on all of this. Is that well, fair? yeah, I, I think actually he, I don't think he uh, intended it to get to the press when it did. Um, you know, it, it right. turned out that uh, you know, everyone was sort of saying, well, this was a complete lie, a complete fabrication. It was done to damage Abraham Lincoln. But uh, as, as the days ticked right. forward, it turned out that actually uh, it was based on reality. And so it was probably a leak from within the White House. Right. So journalist Joe Howard soon confessed to planning that story um, as part of a stock and gold market manipulation scheme. But he later claimed it was only a practical joke. Just so we understand the dynamics here, how would that kind of story financially benefit Howard and what's in it for him? Well, I was, I was really interested to find that uh, in researching this particular period, uh, there was a lot of corruption going on in terms of stories coming from the Civil War front uh, 
to DC, often to you know either Capitol Hill or sometimes even the White House, and then uh, going up to Wall Street to to put bids on stocks, but even more to put uh, to make gold purchases uh, on on Wall Street. And so people were using positive news, you know, and negative news from the front uh, to basically make a killing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so. Uh, the the benefit for um, Joseph Howard, if if indeed you know he was trying to make this uh, financial gain, was there had been some positive news about what was going on at the mm -hmm. front right before this, and so uh, in that time, gold, which was kind of the thing that people would all invest in when when uh, when things looked dire, because you know if uh, there, it was the difference between basically having your money in the greenback, the federal currency, which only would have value if the federal government held together um, or gold, which was going to be, you know, it had, it had lasted through, you know, the ages as being something extremely valuable. It was still valuable uh, overseas. And so if you put your money in gold at uh, news of a crisis for the union, you were, you were likely to, you know, to see a profit. So Joseph Howard leaking a bad story, essentially this, you know, this was a dire thing that, Abraham Lincoln, he was not only saying that he needed more troops, but the reason he needed troops was because we were at the brink of, you know, losing the Civil War. And so uh, that bad news would make gold skyrocket. So if Howard had bought right before uh, that he leaked this, uh, then he would stand to make a mint. Right. And I, I guess the timing of this, uh, as you know, what was going on in the Civil War is important because as I believe this occurred in May 1864, when really yeah. uh, Confederate General Lee was on the run in Virginia. Yeah. Um, so it would have come as a shock when everybody believed the war was coming to an end. Um, exactly. And with the stock exchange plummeting, the value of gold, as you know, it would, would begin to rise, a phenomenon still that exists today, I think. When, yeah. <laughs> when we see that. So detectives later arrested Brooklyn Eagle uh -huh. reporter Francis Mallison, who then confessed uh, his involvement in the hoax and implicated his editor, uh, Joe Howard, as having organized it. Howard was then arrested at his Brooklyn home, um, as I understand it, and then later made a full confession. So this seems like a fairly rock solid case. Why would anyone later believe rumors that Mary Todd Lincoln linked this, leaked the story to Howard? Well, first of all, there's the fact that, okay, if, if Howard just simply was arrested and he went off to prison and then there was no subsequent story um, that the White House had been planning to call up troops, then everything probably would have, you know, it would have looked like Howard had done this as a lone, right. you know, a lone wolf deed. But uh, even the very day that uh, Howard, you know, the, that the news had broken in, D in New York and caused just a, you know, complete panic throughout the city, uh, as the day wore on after the government had issued these tremendous denials that there was no such thing, this was a hoax on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, by the end of the day, rumors started going around that actually the War Department had planned to uh, bring on, uh, you know, to, to call for a draft for 300,000 soldiers. So just, you know, slightly lowered figure, but still the same idea. So what becomes really interesting, you know, when you're involved in the scholarly research is that as you go back into uh, Lincoln's official letters and documents that are, you know, with the, the Libra Library of Congress, um, you find that actually he did draft this call for 300,000 soldiers and it was dated the same day as uh, the the fake proclamation mm -hmm. uh, and he and he he put it in his drawer and didn't send it out. And so the question, no one knows exactly why he didn't send it out, but it goes to explain that, you know, that when he heard that this draft proclamation had appeared in New York, he went into the biggest fury, you know, one witness said that he'd ever seen him in his whole presidency, um, because to him, what had happened was, you know, it's something that he had put, put away in his drawer had ended up in the New, New York newspapers the very same day. Right, right. Um... That, that's yeah, it's fascinating, and um, I'm I'm curious to what degree um, Mary Todd Lincoln had pressure, or how much this this later rumor that that she did it to pay, hoping for a financial windfall for her own debts. How, how much was that believed? Um, I mean, maybe there are people who are eager for any sort of negative news about the Lincolns that 
sort of fit into the narrative they wanted to hear. But was this sort of considered a, a fringe conspiracy theory or were, or were there elements of the mainstream that bought into the, into the Lincolns having something to do with it? Well, the thing, there was a lot swirling around in terms of people suspecting that uh, maybe the story wasn't exactly how Lincoln had portrayed it. Um, for example, one of the amazing uh, documents that I was able to use for this uh, research was mm -hmm. uh, the series of letters between Will Prime and his wife, Mary Prime. Now, Will Prime was the editor of one of the newspapers that got shut down. And the, you know, it's one of those flukes and benefits of, uh, of what happened in history that Mary Prime happened to choose that time to go to Hartford, Connecticut to visit with her family. And so there's these letters back and forth mm -hmm. between them, um, even multiple ones in a single day that give you a kind of TikTok of, mm -hmm. of what they're feelings were and their uh, suspicions. Um, so she actually early on said, it's not what it seems. I don't believe that Joseph Howard is the sole culprit. Um, and she put out various theories to her husband of what she thought could be uh, happening. And I think that the, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, no one, no one at the time really linked Mary Todd Lincoln directly publicly about this. It was more of a kind of forensic examination that I conducted after the fact because mm. I started coming across very, very small mentions of this possibility that, you know, this was a leak um, from, from the White House. And then there's a letter from uh, a congressman, uh, Sunset Cox, where he has written to Manton Marble, the other editor who's arrested, and he says, uh, this this is based on fact and in fact you know and it it likely is from Mary Todd Lincoln so then you have to go back and look at her uh, past uh, moments where she had leaked information to the press um, I there was a, a big case that had come up a couple of years before where someone had leaked uh, President Lincoln's State of the Union address a piece of it to the New York newspapers and it p became part of this congressional investigation and they kept honing in showing the link between her uh, and this, you know, this gardener who had passed the information on to the New York uh, reporter and it was she was she was about to be called in for uh, serious questioning when uh, the investigation was shut down um, out of sort of sympathy for the family because it was the time when their son uh, was dying of what seems to be typhoid. Mm. So um, and then, you know, as I went deeper into it, you look at the fact that she was in a financial crisis at that time. She makes reference to having to figure out a way um, to get around that. Uh, she was rumored to be extremely close, a close confidant of the newspaper journalists um, that were that I focused on, Joseph Howard. And then as you go further on, there's more evidence, um, which, you know, is part of the unfolding of the book. It sounds so fascinating. I mean, really is a uh, full of intrigue, almost um, it could, seems like it could be the, the basis for a uh, a movie or a Netflix show, right? I mean, I'm sure I'm sure you'd love for them to pick that up and and turn that into that, right? Well, the thing is, it's when I was it was one of those things, and I mean, maybe you you know you probably have experienced this yourself, but it's just that the the when you start to uh, do the research and then things just keep you know sort of adding on to 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 make it more compelling. Um, I found it not only was it so interesting in the kind of, you know, who done it aspect and obviously that's a fun thing to write, you know, it's it's like a great pleasure to be able to 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 do that for the reader to give take mm -hmm. them on the same track that you experienced as you were doing the research. Um but it's, you know, it's also it gave me such a broader understanding of what was going on in the Civil War because I think, you know, there's this uh tendency to think that there was this great sobriety with that everyone you know, which everyone uh, used to view the war, you know, that there was, it was the suffering and the, you know, the dramatic, um, uh, you know, it's so crucial moral um, issues at stake. But I saw a totally other side that was going on in New York City in particular, where there was a lot of right. frivolity, there was a lot of exploitation of the situation just to make money. Um, there were people with really personal problems such as Mary Todd Lincoln's, um, who was, you know, who was, you know, she was basically scurrying around trying as hard as she possibly could to disguise the fact that she was in such debt 
and it could cause the, um, you know, the, the loss of Abraham Lincoln in his reelection, which was that very year in 1864. Right. I, I, and I think to me, when I see some of those, it really underscores my appreciation for uh, Lincoln and what all he had to contend with. I mean, you've got yeah. the greatest test the country has ever seen and really yes. since. Um, tremendous pressure. I mean, thousands of lives at stake. And yet you have really what turned out to be thousands of distractions yeah. constantly. And yet somehow he was able to be the sort of steady course um, and, and and see really the nation through it. It's it's really quite remarkable. Well, um, an extreme, an extreme, uh, uh, you know, I agree with you completely on the distraction aspect, but then there's also just the extreme crises that are um, beyond just the, you know, enormous war toll right. and having to know that you've sent these people off to, to essentially, you know, to die. I mean, they were dying in such large numbers, but there's also just the, the economic situation for the United States at that particular moment in 1864, where when I started to look at the numbers where you had, you know, uh, they were spending, you know, $2.5 million a day or something on the war, but they're, but, you know, and it was just draining out of the coffers and you had people from, you know, everyone from just a straight Wall Street speculator to uh, Confederates to foreign investors who were trying to drive down the value of the dollar all the time. So mm -hmm. he had the tensions of not only this war that very well could have been lost, um, but the destruction of the economy the threats against him, you know, for racial, racially, you know, motivated reasons. Um, and then, a, you know, a cabinet that was often in chaos. And that was the same year that uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, Chase, resigned. And, and uh, you know, Lincoln finally accepted that resignation because he said that they had come to a point, you know, where it had become an embarrassment to them both. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And then, and then, of course, the death of his son, I mean, you know, and and Mary Todd Lincoln often being in a really strained mental state. Right, right. Well, yeah, you've got wonderful, uh, intriguing, interesting material uh, to work with. And Michael Burlingham, who's a good friend of mine and a former guest on this podcast, he called your book, quote, meticulously researched and carefully argued. And I view that as really high praise coming from what I view as one of the best researchers in this field. What was your approach to researching and writing this book and, and how long did it take you? Well, first of all, I have to tell you when I received that, I can't tell you what that meant to me because when you, I mean, you probably also had similar feelings when you're going through his work. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I certainly didn't know him before, but only knew him through his work. And, and it, I, you know, you're, you not only have his uh, incredible biography of Lincoln, but all of those, uh, the work that he did delving through the archives to get the letters of, um, mm -hmm. you know, people who were on his staff. And I think those things are, you know, the insights you get about the administration are incredible uh, in that way. And also he has such a nuanced uh, approach to interpreting the material. Mm -hmm. So I sent him the book after I had finished uh, writing it, just thinking, you know, well, he's, he's, sir, he's my hero in this, um, in this area of scholarship. And so when he sent that back, I was really thrilled. And also the other part that I liked about it was that he, he seemed very engaged in the actual story so that he, he provided me another piece of material that um, could be helpful, you know, in expanding uh, the, the reporting even further. So, uh, so yeah, so many, much of my research began with the, the great people out there who are doing Lincoln research. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was uh, him, uh, you know, and then David Herbert Donald's work um, and, uh, and then, you know, Harold Holzer and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Mark Epstein and uh, David Mark Epstein and the, uh, you know, and on and on. But the, but the other thing is that I, as a reporter, I have been so excited about the fact that all of these newspapers are coming online and not just through the Library of Congress, but other um, different digital archives. And those journalists were such great writers and they got such detail uh, and now allow us to view incidents that we never had a view on before. And mm -hmm. so a lot of my research is taking some of those digital archives, which are often they might not have the best search engine. So you're essentially 
taking this, you know, vat, this bushel of, you know, corn kernels or something and picking up each one to see if it might have something of interest. So I did a lot of that. I did a lot of looking at digital memoirs that are now available that, you know, there's one copy in Germany or something. Mm -hmm. And now we can see it even if you're in New York, but also there's the library of Congress, uh, the national archives, New York public library manuscript division, the New York historical society, and then, you know, various smaller, uh, uh, you know, archives around the country as well. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Harold Holzer, and um, he'll actually be a, a guest on this podcast soon as well for his um, book that's coming out, or I guess it's just out now, just out now, The Presidents Versus the Press, um, and it seems to uh, go hand in hand with yours quite well, and I'll, I'll be mm -hmm. interested to see to what extent you, the incident you write about plays in his book as well. Um, so that, that, that'll be interesting, but, yeah. but well, it's, it, yeah, I, I've seen quite a lot of high praise for your book, and um, I'm confident that um, it, it will do well, and it's also um, quite timely. And I guess that brings me to a, another question I have. We have no shortage of planted stories and media manipulation today. Is, is Donald Trump simply heir to an unfortunate tradition, or is his approach to the press more unique and dangerous in some way, in your opinion? Well, I think, you know, it, again, it was extremely interesting to me to see how much uh, Abraham Lincoln was a savvy press uh, manipulator. I mean, uh, back when he was, you know, even when he was a lawyer, there was a period of time when he was, he wrote uh, uh, under the pseudonym Rebecca, um, you know, writing these scathing uh, sort of stories. They were kind of almost like fables, but they were, mm -hmm. they, they, tried, you know, sort of claimed to be reality about uh, somebody he actually had a case against. Um, he, you know, he bought the one of the most amazing things and this came to me through Holzer's uh, research was that he bought a newspaper in uh, the center in the you know middle of the country that was a German language newspaper he he drew up the contract himself and it had um, a clause it was a secret contract it had a clause that if they went against the Republican platform he could kill the newspaper um, wow. And that, you know, was significant because it was, he bought it in uh, leading up to the 1860 election and the German vote was kind of crucial to his, um, his election. So uh, there were those items. Then it's, you know, he has people on staff who were writing for the uh, newspapers under assumed names. There's even a, I went to look at, um, you know, there's this idea that he might have even contributed a piece or two himself to a, a newspaper in Philadelphia when he was president. Um, and there is a document that's between the editor and, um, you know, someone down in on the Hill that does make it kind of seem as if it was uh, mm -hmm. actually Lincoln himself who wrote the piece. So there's a lot of that that went on. I think the big difference um, is that his, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, Lincoln, I admire Lincoln so, you know, tremendously. He wasn't a perfect person though either, um, but he was never an egotist as far as I could tell. I didn't come mm -hmm. across that particular strain in his personality. And I think that if you look at the incidents that, um, you know, where Trump has done some kind of manipulation of the press, it's often to either ensure or, you know, reify his, his personal power, um, or it's to create an enemy, you know, to, so mm -hmm. that there's something to fight against, right? So that the, you know, it's kind of like the old school politics of, you know, have a threat that you can use as a way to galvanize a particular voting block. And so Lincoln uh, had his uh, moments of passion and fury at different newspaper editors and all the rest, but it wasn't at the level of a kind of, you know, um, the press is evil uh, across the board. I, he, he didn't make those kinds of declarations. So I think that's, that's the big difference between them. Um, right. But I mean, I think that the book is also taking a clear-eyed view of uh, Lincoln was was pretty ready to throw out some constitutional rights if it fit his purposes. Um, I mean, his purposes were more uh, serious and profound um, than anything than what we're facing now. But I think that this the story the book also is trying to say 
you know, the constitution and the, the, you know, the bulwark of the country is the job of every citizen to fight, to protect, you know, you don't, you, you can't just hope that your leader is going to be, you know, a saint throughout the course of their presidency. Right. It's, it's really, you know, it came down in this case to, to lawyers and, you know, an attorney general and, you know, newspaper reporters and some citizens on the street to rise up and say, you know, enough's enough. You have to actually protect freedom of speech. Right. You make reference to the uh, pseudonyms that Lincoln wrote under, and there is, as as I'm sure, as you know, a, a, always a huge push among Lincoln historians to identify everything that Lincoln ever wrote. And that poses a problem. And, um, Michael Burlingham has has a huge desire, and I know he's he and I have talked about this of of trying to identify some computer programs or software which are out there wow. that would help us search possible editorials that were written and compare yeah. the the writing style to see if you know we oh. can determine with some confidence of whether that was him or not. You know, because there are a decent amount of um, articles that people suspect may have been by Lincoln or aren't sure, you know, and so, um, and now with everything getting digitized, I think, you know, that kind of software assistance would be beneficial. That's, that's fantastic. So have you actually begun the process of that? Uh, No, I I think, I think, I think Michael in particular has been, he and I talked about possible software programs. And so, so we haven't really went down that path in depth, but, um, I, I think I think that could be an interesting uh, in scholarly endeavor and would Absolutely. certainly help out the scholarship a lot, you know. And oh, it would be incredible. I mean, yeah. do you remember when um, Primary Colors, that novel came oh, out? Oh, yes, but, absolutely. And that's how they figured out that it was, uh, oh, it was yeah, a joke yeah. time because they were comparing those particular words. I mean, the Rebecca thing's interesting because some people say, oh, it was all Mary Todd Lincoln, you know, right. and so then I did a couple of, you know, ways of checking the thing. And it seems as if while she probably wrote those later pieces, the poem and all that, Mm -hmm. that that first piece is very likely him just partly because the the feelings about the banking system are so extreme and are so connected Mm -hmm. to his um, views and not hers. You know, it's like that it, on that level there, I was looking at the language on that and it definitely seemed as if uh, it had to have been Lincoln himself who wrote that. Yeah. So what kind of lessons can we draw uh, today from the 1864 press incident that really takes a central role in your book? Is there any lessons we can draw from it? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of them, actually. I mean, one is the one I already cited, which I think that the idea that heroes have to come from all over and we can't get complacent that just because we don't have, you know, the title of representative or senator or president, um, you know, it doesn't mean that we're, we, we have no power to actually make sure we hold the Constitution uh, you know, the norms intact. So there's that one. The other thing that was interesting to me is that there was a lot of fake news back then. Um, there were, you know, I mean, some of them were extreme forms of fake news where, you know, they were, uh, they were, I mean, the moon hoax was before this, but that was probably the most extreme where they pretended that there was life on the moon with the animals scampering around for six days, you know, a newspaper put out stories about that and everyone bought into it. Um, uh, there were, and then there were smaller things so that, in fact, many, um, you know, reports from the front would say at the top of it, this is important if true, you know, so they were open to the idea that n- maybe not everything they were getting were, was exactly mm-hmm. factual. But the thing to learn from it was that the public didn't seem to be completely horrified or distraught about this. They just understood that with so many newspapers, just as we have so many news sources now online and everything else, that they were responsible for sifting the information, you know, that they had to look at other outlets to see if the things matched up and they needed to look at, you know, at that time there were anonymous reporters just as a sort of norm, like you, the newspaper was the voice, not a particular reporter uh, Mm -hmm. for the most part. But they did try to tr- match up, you know, the, the, the reliability of particular uh, columnists when they were named or newspapers in general. And so that's our job now, too. And, th- and the other thing was that, you know, it, when things, when news was extreme, there was a high likelihood that that was not correct. <laughs> Do you know, I mean, right. similar to, to now. I mean, when you, when you get a 
I mean, my policy just as a journalist and a former editor and all those other things is when I read a story and it strikes me as horrifically um, upsetting, I definitely double check it in, def you know, in different ways mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, it actually is uh, true. The, the, we do have a fair uh, barometer for what is human nature. And I think right. that um, if we put that in place, uh, we'll do better. But the, the, you know, and the other thing is to follow the money. I mean, there was the, uh, in the, those days, people were putting out stories to manipulate the stock market. And I think mm -hmm. we need to look at who profits from one story or another um, to understand its source and, and it, its veracity. You're such a highly successful author and journalist in a lot of different fields. I mean, you don't focus on one area in particular, but you've mentioned uh, your admiration for Lincoln and possibly delving into this uh, caused that to grow. Do you see any other Lincoln works or Lincoln books in your future? Well, um, I, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine, Ted Whitmer, who just wrote this amazing Lincoln book about the, his journey to the White House, um, the 13 days. Uh, and we were saying how, you know, when you're outside of the world of Lincoln Scott research, you think, wow, it's amazing that people dedicated their entire careers to this one topic. And now we have, the, we have it too. <laughs> right. So that we were talking about how there were all these things that cropped up in the research that you're just actually, you know, itching to get back in to try to, uh, learn more about. And so I do think there are a few things that I would like to pursue. I mean, there's even a few things that Joseph Howard makes um, allusion to in some of his uh, later columns in his career. And while he often was a, uh, you know, a confabulist, he was, he was not, um, you couldn't trust many of the things that he said. There were other items that, you know, where he, because of his sourcing, he mm -hmm. actually, uh, you know, knew something. So there was, so there's a few intriguing elements there. The other thing I, and I don't know if you've found this too, but the other thing I find really interesting is that you'll come across some accounts say, you know, there was something in the late 1950s where a collector was selling off Mary Todd Lincoln letters. And there was just a little bit about what was in those letters, um, but they weren't fully revealed. And they went to auction and some private collector bought them. So I, based on what the contents were, I searched everywhere trying to see if they're, they're, they could have surfaced mm -hmm. and they haven't yet. But the material that's in them is so interesting that, um, that, it makes you want to find, you know, find where they are. And there's the problem of that uh, once uh, the contents of a letter is fully known, it becomes less valuable, which right. is annoying to historians. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so we do have to wait for that moment that it will come out or, you know, Michael, you know, uh, is come, Burlingame come, you know, happens mm -hmm. to come across it in some archive, but there's things like that too. There's parts to the story we still, still don't fully know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are countless books on Abraham Lincoln. I think I've seen the statistics. I mean, certainly the most written about American in history and one of the most written about human beings in terms yeah. of sheer books. But I'm always a little surprised that, Hollywood hasn't followed suit. I mean, the demand is clearly yeah. there for that. And yet, I mean, you know, in modern times, we had the Spielberg Lincoln movie, but yeah. there's not a whole, and there's a few others. I mean, it's not like it's, there's nothing, but yeah. it just the disparity between the number of books and number of uh, movies and TV shows is, is quite uh, remarkable to me. I, I agree. And one thing that I think gets in the way is because people get the idea of, you know, we're so fixated on the idea of Lincoln in his stove, you know, mm -hmm. a stove type uh, pipe hat and, um, and this almost caricature of him. So that I think part of it comes from the fact that people have a hard time thinking of him as a, you know, fully human or something. I, and so there's this moment that I came across where one of the people who worked with him said that when he, that, that they will never forget the way he would get when he was telling a story where he would run his fingers through his hair and his black hair would stand up like he was electrocuted or something, stand up on the top <laughs> of his head. And for some reason, yeah. that image would, made it really easy for me to understand him as a person, you know, because mm -hmm. he has this kind of quirky, you know, distracted sometimes, you know, sometimes impenetrable 
um, personality, but you know, and that sort of goes along with it as way. So I think that what it would require is somebody to try to get a little bit away from the idea of him as just a an engraving and think of him more as a you know as a as a human uh, moving through. Life. Yeah, it does place. I mean, I guess another way to look at it, it places quite a lot of pressure on an actor. Um, Very and, much. Yeah, yeah. You can, there's a strong risk of getting it wrong, yeah. um, either historically or just our own preconceived notions of what is historic. So, yeah. Um, well, we, we often like to end these podcasts with uh, a favorite Lincoln story or anecdote that you might have. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious if you have one you'd like to share. Well, the, I mean, there's, there's many that are, you know, sort of funny or, uh, you know, or just like, you know, to see his, uh, his way of, you know, tweaking different people, um, you know, who he finds pompous or what have you. But the one that kind of meant the most to me was actually the one of pathos, which is, it's, it's the one that I was referring to before um, about when he goes to the hill and suddenly appears and pleads that, uh, that he knows no one in his family who has engaged in treasonous activity mm -hmm. and he's, you know, ravaged with sorrow. So the, the first time I came across that, I was really struck by it. And then as I was researching further, that story comes into doubt because there's, there's in fact a long academic paper where someone tears it apart saying, well, the post that came from, a, you know, a postmaster general telling it to this person on the Hill. But if you match up when this person was postmaster general and when this person was, you know, in office, it can't possibly uh, have occurred because they weren't in those positions at that time. So mm -hmm. then I thought, well, what if you just look at the core reality of it as opposed to the coincidence of who's telling it? Because we know that people remember you know, they'll have little tweaks of remembering wrong so that, you know, maybe the titles were wrong or what have you. So I just went day by day in the newspaper around that time to see if I could find anything about that would, you know, showed anything about it. And in fact, there's this moment where, uh, you know, one other critique they had of it was that, you know, he, it happened in the morning and he was, there were never sessions in the morning. But then in the newspaper, it says, on, I think it was February 14th, um, Abraham, you know, the president arrived for a morning session uh, with a group that was investigating this very issue and gave definitive um, statements about the fact that his family wasn't involved. So then I, so I, and it was the, you know, it was basically a week or five days before his son died. And so I was, so then you realize, well, okay, he was there, <laughs> you know, at that moment, it has the same resonance with what, you know, the sorrow that they saw in his face and all that. And so that sort of thing is just kind of deeply moving to me. The idea, you know, that mm -hmm. to imagine this man who had all of those crises bearing down on, on him at the same time, showing up there to, uh, to testify, to try to protect his wife, who was well aware had, you know, problem emotional problems right right well elizabeth i can't thank you enough for uh joining us on the lincoln log podcast so as a reminder for our listeners your new book is lincoln's lie a true civil war caper through fake news wall street and the white house from counterpoint press and it's officially released october 6th uh depending on when this uh podcast airs if it's maybe a, just a day or two before or slightly before then at any rate, you can pre-order it, but certainly by October 6th, uh, go to your favorite local bookstore or online uh, dealer and, and order it. I have no doubt it'll be, it, it'll be um, engaging and interesting. Certainly, you're a phenomenal storyteller, and this uh, has plenty of material to work with. So we appreciate you delving into it and adding to the uh, Lincoln, the, the large body of Lincoln material even more. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Lincoln Log. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like this podcast, please consider rating it on iTunes and leaving a review. This helps other people find the show.